Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I want to show you how to play Archmage, a game designed by Tim Hirama and published by Starling Games. In Archmage, you and your opponents are vying to become the new chief mage of a world that has been bereft of magic for a long time. You're all these trainee wizards who are trying to unlock spells that have been lost to time and initiate in apprentices into different schools of magic. This game also has a very nice solo mode that involves an AI opponent called the Warlord, and that's what I'll be showing you today. Archmage is a game of magic, but it's also a game of area control. If you don't control the right areas on the map, you can't get the right resources you need to power your spells. And your spells contribute to your ability to maintain dominance over the map. So first I'm going to show you how to set that part up. The first thing you're always going to want to do is put these enclaves for the six major races in the middle of the board. These races are also connected to specific schools of magic, which is something we're going to get into very shortly. The next thing we're going to do is set up these wilderness tiles. You should have five tiles of each of five types of wilderness. So we have libraries, crypts, groves, ruins, and mines. As you can see, these are actually color coordinated with various races that are on this ring, except for the demons, which we'll talk about later. But these are the areas in the wilderness that you'll be fighting to control, and also they're going to produce relics for you that you need to make your spells happen. They have this sort of mountain looking design on the back of the tile, so you can identify them as, um, as wilderness tiles when they are face down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna shuffle these up, we're gonna put them face down on the map, and I'll show you how that works. So now we have a nice little pile of mixed up wilderness tiles over here. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use them to make a ring all the way around this little central piece. All right, now with this ring done, what you're gonna do, at least this is how I remember how to do it, is you want a row of four down each side. There are other types of tiles that are gonna, gonna come in around the edges. There is a um, little map of how this should be done in the rule book, so don't freak out if my way of doing it doesn't please you. So I put four down the sides and then what you're going to need is to put them here, two more, and then up here you're going to have two more. So you might have noticed we took 25 tiles out and we've only placed 20, 24. There's going to be one that just gets randomly left out of the game. Just put it aside without looking at it. Now we're going to add some towns to the map. So we're going to put towns and basically towns are places that you can visit that can help you look for more relics, they can help you recruit. Um, it just sort of depends on whether you control the town and what's going on when you end a turn there. So it's something that we're gonna cover as we go through the game. So there are four towns in this game, and there are also going to be six camps slash hybrid race enclaves. So these are the sort of major races of our world. However, there are also hybrid races that are versed in two different types of magic who live on sort of the outskirts of society. So there are the gremlins, the drow, and the trolls, and there are also three camps. And these are gonna get mixed up and kind of put on the outskirts of the world. The camps actually represent little um, dwellings of people who have magical powers but who are looking for a potential person to serve, align themselves with, so they can develop some of their magical powers. So these, will, by the way, will have this sort of camp signal symbol on the back. So the wilderness have a mountain. This has a tent. So we'll put camps here at these edges of the map. And we don't know what they are until we go over there and explore them, which is something we will be doing during the game. We're also going to go ahead and put this cool cursed tower in the middle of the board because we absolutely just can. And we're also going to put the warlock, or the warlord rather, the warlord meeple here in the middle. And he's going to come out um, in various ways as we get playing. I'll show you some sample turns. And he is going to just rampage around and make a lot of trouble for us as we play. But first, it's time to talk about the player board. So this is the main terrain board. We're gonna talk about the player setup now so you can see how that part works. Archmage also has quite a bit going on when it comes to the individual player boards. So I'm gonna show you how that setup works as well. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna take this individual player board. This represents the floor of your mage tower and these are shells where you're gonna keep relics that are used to initiate apprentices and uh, power your spells. 
Then I just keep all the starting tokens for each player in these little drawstring bags, but I'll show you how those work. You take out all of your pieces. And the first thing that we're gonna need are these little planet pieces. There are six of them. And basically the idea is that when the planets align, then the game will end and an Archmage will be chosen. Um, but the thing that's also sort of interesting is that the planets are used to keep track of your turn count and they also can give you the occasional relic, which is pretty cool. So let's just randomly put them somewhere. Eh. And then in a two player game, which is how you set up the, um, the solo game as well, we are going to put two planets here. And basically what's going to happen is that every single turn, we choose to move a planet one towards the center. Once they hit the center, they have to stay there. And after 15 turns, all the planets will align. The other thing that's kind of neat is that these little numbers give you your starting amounts of relics. Um, they are never used again after the first turn of the game. You just get one relic for a planet that you move at the beginning of a turn. But what's really neat about this is that, um, you know, we're going to get some little starter resources to help us as we begin our game. So I know that I'm going to get one matter relic. I know that I'm going to have two will relics. So you put the cubes match in there. I'm also going to have two nature relics. So that's good. I think those are seeds. Um, I will start with two blood relics. That's not grim at all. One death relic and two time relics relics. So basically I have just a little bit of starting material in each of the schools of magic that are going to be part of the game. I also have my little mage and he's going to hang out on the board once we start playing. This is my mage tower, which I'm going to place on the board only once at some point during the game, uh, but I will have to place it in order to start promoting apprentices. And I'm also going to have some followers because what's the point of being a mage if people don't follow you and think you're amazing. So there are 25 of these follower pieces, 10 of them are in your supply and they're not immediately accessible. 15 of them are part of your starting, um, entourage basically. And they just kind of follow you around telling you how great you are. I don't really know, but you use them to hold down territory and you can initiate them into various schools of magic. So there should be 15 of these little guys at the start of the game, and they can go in and out of the supply depending on what happens to them throughout. The other thing that you're going to need is this little mantle, and this helps you sort the spells that you've acquired throughout the game. So we'll move these guys over. Sorry. Um, and basically you're going to have spaces for fundamental advanced and master spells that you can pick up and cast throughout the game. Although actually in the solo game, there are no master level spells. So I'm going to show you what that deck is going to look like and how to construct it. So when you're constructing your spell book, the important thing to remember is that every mage in a game of Archmage is going to have the same general set of spells to, um, to use during a game. So everyone's deck is going to be the same. So the best way to sort them when you first get the game is to just sort the cards by type and then to create four different piles with each card in it. For the solo game, what you're going to need to do is out of the cards that you've pulled, you need to find all the cards that have this symbol on them. So anything that has this little warlord head symbol on it. So that three towers is multiplayer. The warlord head is for solo. So as long as it has that head on it, then it's a card that you want in your deck. Some of them will only have mage towers on them. And that means that those are for the multiplayer game only, including this master level spell, because you take out all the master level spells for solo. But there's actually a symbol on the cards that'll help you figure out what should go in that deck. I actually found the initial sorting a little bit difficult because of the foiling on the cards. But if you just sort of make sure that you have four different piles, each with the same, um, the same cards in them, you should just have a deck for each player and it's totally fine. We are not, however, going to start this game with any spells in hand because we don't have any apprentices who have been initiated into various schools of magic yet, which is something that we'll be discussing very shortly. In a solo game, then one other thing that you should do is you should get the pieces out, the follower pieces for another player's color. In this case, I'm going to use white and those are going to be the used as the warlords followers. So they are going to, he's going to have access to all 25 of them. So as we're about to discover, the warlord doesn't cast spells, but he moves around like a maniac, attacks you like crazy and will um, have access to more followers than you do, especially at the start of the game, which makes him a bit challenging. 
There are also two victory conditions that we need to talk about so that you can understand what I'm going for in my sample turns of this game. So in order to defeat the Warlord, there are two things that you must do in order to have victory. The first one is to have four apprentices on the master level. So you don't have access to master spells, but you will need to have four apprentices who are on the master level ring of this, um, of your, of your uh, mage tower. So you need to promote apprentices in time and efficiently enough to make sure that they're hitting those high levels during the game. Our other goal is going to be a territorial one where we are going to make sure that we control three out of the five types of wilderness areas to be found on this map. So a lot of our game is going to be gathering spells, but also a lot of our game is going to be exploring and uncovering territory and trying to make sure that we control it. So in Archmage, the Warlord is actually going to go first. His movements are going to be determined by two die rolls. One, oops, sorry, to determine which direction he's going to move. And then um, the other, so one, two, three. And the other then will determine whether he goes clockwise or counterclockwise around the ring that he is on. So see how you have an inner ring here and sort of an outer ring around that? The Warlord is actually going to alternate which ring he travels on each turn, and um, that will be a set thing about his movement. The rest is determined by die rolls. So he's going to start on this inner ring. So we're going to roll a die, and we actually rolled a one. So what's going to happen is at first, he's going to go here, because we're starting him on the inner ring. Then we're going to roll this next die. We rolled a six. So that means he's going to move clockwise. So his movement is a little bit like ours in that he will have five movement points just like we will on our turn. However, there's only certain things that he will do. So he's going to go, he'll spend one movement point to explore, two to explore again, three, four, and then five. So those are his five movement points. Also, he's going to go ahead and claim all of the spaces that he's been on by placing one of his followers there. Now what's going to happen is the Warlord is going to do his end of turn action, and that's going to be to place wards on areas that he controls and is adjacent to so that he can keep me from taking them over quite so easily when I want to come around. So he'll place a ward here where he currently is. He's also going to place a ward on this library because he's adjacent to it. And basically his turn involves either clearing my followers out of space that I claimed or uncovering and claiming space for himself. He's very interested in territory and that is just how he rolls. So that was the first warlord turn. Now I'm going to take a turn. Since this is my very first turn of the game, I don't need to worry about things like moving the planets or um, refreshing my spell book or any of those things. I haven't cast any spells, I don't have any spells, and this is the very first turn. So we're just gonna go for it. I have five movement points, and there are some specific ways that you can spend them, which I just sort of showed you quickly with the Warlord. We'll explain more in depth on a player turn because that's the turn that's gonna make the most sense and be of the most interest to us. So our turn is gonna have three phases. And what that's going to mean is that we'll do preparation on most turns, but not this turn because there's nothing to prepare. This is our first turn. Then we're going to do a journey step. And the journey step basically is where we're going to spend our five movement points. We can use those points to travel. We can use them to explore, or we can use them to attack. So if I wanted to come and remove the, um, the warlord's, you know, wards and, and his apprentices, I would be able to do that using an attack. But for now, I want to go and forge my own path. The reason I want to do that is that it is important to me to get relics. And you get relics for areas that you explore. So what I'm going to do is I know he's not going to mess around on here this next turn because he'll switch to the outer ring. I'm going to do one, two, three. So that's going to explore. I'm going to give myself one orange colored uh, will relic for that. So my relic count goes up. So it's three movements. And then we'll do four, five to explore. So I'll get another will relic, which is also telling me where I should maybe make my first apprentices. So I'm going to go ahead and put an apprentice on each of these. 
Yes, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to put an apprentice on each of these. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my journey's end phase. So I have used up all of my points. And now, depending on the space you're on, that affects the kind of journey's end action you can take. In the wilderness, I can basically do what the warlord did and put my own wards of protection up on my own spaces. Or at some point in the game, I'm going to choose to build my mage tower. But I want to time that properly. So for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and place wards myself. So I'm going to put a ward here and a ward here. Now it's the warlord's turn again. So let's go ahead and roll and see what he's going to do. All right, so this time, so what's going to happen is he, I know that he's on the inner ring. So he's going to move back to the tower, but I know that this time he's going to go to the outer ring. And he's going to do it in this three direction that I have here. So one, two, three. He's going to come here to the outer ring. Then we're going to roll. So a five. This time he's going to go counterclockwise. So he's going to spend one movement point and put down a follower. He's going to come two and put a follower on this town. Three, four. He'll put a follower here. And he's also going to just move five onto this camp, but he actually cannot explore it because he does not have enough movement points left. He's already spent them all. So that's where he's going to be now. And now he's not going to be able to put down any wards or take any extra actions because he is stuck down here on an unexplored tile. So he's just going to hang out down here for a while and we are going to get to make our move. So let's see what I want to do. It's um, time for my preparation phase. So I'm going to show you how that works really quick and then we will go from there. So here's the floor of my mage tower, which is where I'm going to prepare and plot my next turn. As you can see, I've gained a couple of wills since the last time you checked because I um, have earned them by exploring new territory. So the first thing that I need to do is align the planet. So I need to move one of my planets inward by a count of one. So I'm already doing pretty well with will. I'm going to go ahead and just keep going that direction and I'll show you why shortly. So I will move my relics up by one. This planet has moved one, and that is around one out of 15 in this game. I don't have any spells, so there is no need to refresh my spell book or be concerned with other preparatory things because I have nothing to prepare. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over and explore this campsite, and I'm gonna show you what that might be able to do. So let's do one, two, three, my um, third movement point. So I'm going to go ahead and put a follower here and I'm going to give myself um, one bone relic because I have landed on a crypt. Then I'm going to do four, five. So I'm going to make sure that I also leave an apprentice here. And now I'm on a camp. And the camps are actually very cool. You can take a different kind of journeys into action there than you can when you're on a wilderness tile. So remember how at the end of my last turn, I decided that I was going to place some wards and my other option was to build my mage tower, but I wasn't ready. So that was that move. But now I want to camp. And so I can't do the ward thing. I have to do a different action because I'm on a different kind of location. So the camps are great because what I'm going to be able to do is I can recruit three followers from my supply to my company. So remember those guys that we put in the bag? I can take three of those dudes out now and put them in my entourage for immediate use as I travel around this board. So that is going to be my journeys in action. I get to grab three new apprentices, followers, I guess, they're not apprentices yet, and they can go into my company. So when mages die, they go here, and then I have to take a recruit action to get them back out of the bag and into the supply. So the more guys you can have ready to go, the better in this game. Now the warlord's going to strike again. He was on this outer ring, so we're going to know that he's going to go to the inner ring this time. So let's put him back at his tower and see where he's going to move. So he rolled a five. That means that he is going to move out, no, towards me. So he's going to come out here and he's going to spend five movement points. Let's see what direction he will go in. So he's gonna go counterclockwise. The first thing he's going to do is spend one movement point to kill my dude and put him back in my supply. So remember that bag that I took some recruits out of? 
he's dead, so he gets to go back in it, and I can't replace him until I do another recruit action. So it's a good thing I recruited some people last time. Then he's gonna go two, three. Oh, he will also place one of his followers as a free action. Place another follower. Four, five. So he's uncovered a lot of exciting stuff, but it's all for him, sadly. And now that he's on an uncovered space, he's going to perform a journey's end action, which is going to be to throw out a couple of wards. So he's gonna defend the turf that he just took from me. Now I'm going to prepare another turn. Again, I don't have any spells. This is pretty, the preparation phase for me is pretty boring right now. So there's no spell effects to resolve. There's no spell book to update. I don't even have any apprentices yet. So we're just gonna have to like, get far enough in this game where you can see that stuff happen. So I'm gonna move a planet, however. I'm gonna move my yellow one so I can get a matter relic, because that is where I'm looking at the skimpiest. So as you can see, the planets are slowly converging on the middle, and in another 13 rounds, they will be all the way there and aligned. So now it's time for me to do my journey. So I have five movement points to spend, and we should think about the best way to spend them. Hmm. So I think what I'm gonna do is I don't like this dude on the crypt. So I'm gonna do one, two, and take his guy off. And I get to put mine there for free, which is pretty good. Three, four. So I'll get a library. I'm gonna go ahead and take that and I get to claim one time relic over on my, um, my, uh, the floor of my mage tower. Then I'm gonna go five, and I'm gonna show you what happens when you land in a town. As you might have noticed, I'm trying to do a lot of things to let me show you what happens wherever I land so that you get a good idea of what goes on in this game um, in, a, in a sort of bit by bit kind of way. Okay, so now that I've landed on the town, my journey's end phase is going to look a little bit different. The way that it works now is, also I'm going to go ahead and control this town because controlling a town is fun. I am going to um, be able to collect one relic of any of the of the matching type from each area that I control. So what that means is we'll cover my relic guys first. I'm full on will, but I get to collect that one more. I have one library, which is quite convenient, and I'm gonna get one bone relic. So I've actually been able to collect some relics from this camp that I control, I'm going to be able to pull one new follower out of my supply so that guy that the, um, the warlord so cruelly murdered can now come back out into my company. And then in the town, I get to choose. I can either take a relic of my choice or I can choose to um, just take another uh, follower from my supply if I have any followers remaining. So I think what I'd like to do is, you know what, I actually think that I'm going to get another bone relic. I think that's what I wanna do. So let's do that. I'm trying to get, see how um, Will and Death are very close to each other on this magical chart? That means that my apprentices are gonna be able to duel each other and move up in these areas, so I wanna fill those up, especially because time is looking good as well. So that was my entire turn. Now it's the Warlord again. He was in the outer ring this time, he'll be the inner ring next time. So let's see what he rolls. He rolled a one again. So he's gonna go here. And he rolls a three. So this time he's going to move counterclockwise. So he's going to do one, two, and put a follower there. Three, four, and put a follower there and then five. So his fifth movement doesn't really take him anywhere. One thing that's interesting though, is that mages can't really enter spaces that other mages hold. He can pass through a space that I'm in, but I'm not supposed to enter a space that he's on and mages can't enter each other's spaces during the multiplayer game. So I think what I'm gonna do is I wanna go and do a little bit of apprentice initiation so I can show you how it works. So we're gonna work over in that direction. So let's do one, two. So I'm gonna get a time relic and I'm also going to put a follower here to claim the space. Three, four, five. We're gonna land over here 
on the goblins. Oh, and there's something that I should have told you. I actually gained some blood relics during combat. So I got one blood relic when the warlord killed my um, apprentice, well, my follower. And then I also gained one blood relic when I killed one of his. There are no spaces on the maps that are going to get you a blood relic, but you can get them through attacking. So if one of your guys gets attacked and dies, then you will get a, um, a blood relic. If one of, um, if you attack somebody else's guy and kill them, you also get a blood relic. In the multiplayer version of the game, both players get a blood relic. Oh, also in my preparation phase, I should absolutely have advanced one of my uh, planets towards the center. So let's actually just go ahead and do matter again. So we'll bump that one up to three. So that seems like it was a good choice. And that was my turn. However, I've taken a journey's end in an interesting spot. As you can see, I'm on one of these special racial enclaves. And what that means is that now that I'm here, I have the chance to initiate an apprentice. And that's something that I very, very, very much would like to do. So I can initiate up to three apprentices, depending on how many relics I have in this area. Sadly, I only have four relics that are in the death area. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is for every apprentice I want to initiate in this area, I pay two relics. So I'm gonna pay all four of them in order to put two mages from my company onto this part of, um, of my magical floor in my mage tower to symbolize that I have two apprentices who are now versed in the area of death magic. And because I have someone there, that's going to get me a spell in my next preparation phase, which is something that I'll be showing you. So that was my journey's end action, but now I have some apprentices on the board. And that is very, very good for me because it is important that I get moving on that in order to meet the victory conditions of this game. Sadly, it is the Warlord's turn once again. So he rolled a three, but first let's move him to the middle. He was hanging out here on this inner ring, so he's gonna go out this time. So he's already been here, actually. He's gonna go here, and then let's see which way he will move. He's gonna move counterclockwise. I think that I accidentally moved him clockwise when I said he was moving counterclockwise a while ago, but oh well. So he's gonna do one, two, three, four, Five. And he's going to claim both of these spaces with his little minions. But he's not going to take a journey's end action because he's on an unexplored territory. So he's not going to be able to ward them, which is good because it makes it easier to move through and take spots from him. So now we are back to my turn. Fortunately, the Warlord's turns move really fast. So upkeep's easy, which is something that I really appreciate about a solo mode, by the way. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna advance a planet. Let's go ahead and move nature this time. So now I've got like these three planets just kind of hanging out on top of each other, but I've got another nature relic, so that is good. Then what we're gonna do is we are going to refresh or update our spell book. And that's actually gonna be pretty exciting. So now that I have apprentices in that sort of black part of the floor of my mage tower, I have access to death magic and I'm going to get this basic level death spell. It's called Torment and I can cast it on the warlord's turn after he rolls the d6 and then re-roll the die. So I need some more relics to be able to power the spell. Each basic level spell costs one relic and an advanced level spell costs two. But once I have it, I'm able to basically try to manipulate his die rolls a little bit. So this is gonna leave that basic deck and go into my personal spell book. And that was one of the most exciting parts of this game because getting new spells and trying them out is super, super cool. Now it's time for me to spend my movement points. And I have some definite plans for those. I really wanna end up here so that I can initiate some more apprentices on my end of turn uh, my end of my journey's end phase. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one, two, three to take out his ward, four to take off his guy. Just got to get in his way a little bit here. And then five. And I'm going to leave one of my own apprentices behind to hold those ruins. I'm hoping to hit up a town fairly soon and see how many relics I can collect. It just depends on what that warlord do 
in my absence. Okay, so I'm on the dwarf space now, which means that I can do some more initiations. Again, at the cost of two relics per um, apprentice. So I think what I'm gonna do this time is I'm gonna go ahead and spend all the way down. We're gonna get three apprentices in this area. So I'm just gonna put them this way since I keep lifting this up. So there are three will apprentices and I have two death apprentices. As you can see, I might have an eye on getting some time apprentices as well. Basically, I need enough apprentices that I can duel them all the way up to these top levels of magic, and that takes some serious time and effort. So we're gonna see what we can do with that. Also, I would have gotten a blood relic for killing off one of the, um, one of the warlord's guys. So my blood relic supply is also looking pretty good. All right, so now it's the warlord's turn again. He was in the outer ring. He's gonna go inner ring this time and he rolled a four. So what that means is that he's gonna go straight down. He's almost definitely gonna cause some trouble for me. Let's see which way he'll move. Yeah, so he's gonna go counterclockwise, which means he's gonna go this way. So he's actually not gonna mess with me. He's gonna go into spaces he's already been to. So it's gonna be one, he'll uncover a camp, claim it, two, three, four, five. So he's just gonna move. So that actually wasn't too rough of a turn for me. Now it's up to me and we will see what I want to do. So let's do this. Now that's on my mind. I want to keep kind of eating away at his turf, maybe get another couple blood relics, you know, exciting wizard stuff. So I am actually going to move this marker here so that I have six bone relics. This should be zero, by the way. And this should be zero, sorry. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and figure out how to move and be with the elves. So let's see what that will do for me. So I don't have any relics right now, but as part of my prep stage, I also do get to refresh my spell book. Since I now have apprentices in the area of will, I can take this spell, Stone Skin. So basically it's pretty cool. Whenever my opponent, in this case the Warlord, attacks one of my guys, I can put him back in my company instead of in the supply, which means he's free to use later, and I still get a Blood Relic. So once I get some more, um, some more relics in the Will area, I'm definitely gonna be into this. Okay, so I think how I'm gonna do this is I'm literally just gonna go one, two, three, put a guy here, and then just make my fourth move right here. We're just gonna do it like that. So that, that way I will get a blood relic for removing one of the uh, Warlord's guys. And then I'm gonna end up conveniently on the elf space where I can once again pay six relics to initiate three apprentices. I only have one person out in my company right now, which is gonna be rough. I'm gonna need to like make some choices to get some of these guys back in the company so they can be in other places on the map. But I'm gonna show you why I did things this way very shortly, because it's just about time to plant a mage tower. So now it's the warlord's turn again. He's gonna go inner ring this round. And he's rolled a six. So he's gonna go into the middle. And then a six is right here. Again, it's a place where he's kind of been before. We'll see what that means for me. So then we'll roll the die again. He rolled a one. So he is going to move counterclockwise. So he's gonna go one, two. And he will of course claim the space three, four, to attack one of my guys. So he is gonna go back in my supply, not my company, so he's in the bag. I get one blood relic for that, but I'm full up on those, so oh well. He'll leave one of his own followers behind, just to mess with me. And then five. But he can't, he doesn't actually have enough movement points to attack my guys, so that's where his turn will effectively stop. And now it's gonna be my turn again. So let's see what I want to do with these relics. Okay, so I'm totally out of all of these. The other thing is I'm going to need to refresh my spell book. So I've already got these two spells, but now as part of my prep stage, I'm also going to get one more spell, which is going to be a time spell. These are great. So now if the next time I get a time relic, I'm going to be able to spend it if I want to use Quicken. So this one I can cast during my journey phase. My mage gains two extra movement points. So if I wanna go extra far and do extra stuff, that's gonna be awesome. So now I've got these three spells and I'm gonna to need to pick up some relics to figure out what to do with them. 
So I need some relics. I'm gonna go ahead and grab, let's move this planet to the center so that I can get a will relic. And uh, that's gonna be, it's gonna help me be able to cast a spell on the next turn and show you how these sweet, sweet spell cards work. All right, so now I've got five movement points to spend. Hmm, it might be nice to be able to end up on a town so I can get a bunch of stuff. And then the next turn I can plant my mage tower, hopefully, maybe. And um, have an awesome act of power. Either I might just go for it with the mage tower now. I'm not sure which. Let's see. All right, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show you how to promote apprentices. And then I think we're going to call this Let's Play to a close because you'll have seen most of the major aspects of the game other than spell casting. So we'll talk through some of the spells and call it a day on this playthrough so it doesn't take up all of your time. Also, there's some really great tutorials that are done by Tim Harima, the designer himself using Tabletopia. And uh, I highly recommend that you watch those if you want a nice thorough rules explanation as opposed to seeing what the warlord looks like in action. So let's do one, two, three, four, five. So we've taken a couple of his guys off the board because don't forget one of the end conditions of this game is that I need in order to win to have control out of over three out of five different types of wilderness. So right now I am winning on libraries and I'm winning on, that's about it actually. He's winning on everything else. So I've really got to pick it up. So I'm here, and now I'm in this wilderness phase. I'm gonna do a one-time awesome thing. I'm gonna go ahead and plant my mage tower. Boom. When you plant your mage tower, it is a big deal. It is basically like taking over a space on the land, and it allows you to promote your apprentices to higher levels of magic, which is something I'm about to show you. Also, when you first plant your mage tower, and this is the only time, everyone's so amazed in the surrounding areas by what you do that you pick up a bunch of relics, which is also pretty fantastic. So basically what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get an extra bone book and, um, and a will relic from being, from building in this space because I'll collect a resource from here and I'll collect resources from my surrounding followers. The town isn't gonna do anything sadly, but if you're very smart about where you build your mage tower, it can help a lot. So I'll get one book, which is really nice. I will get one bone, which is also nice so I can actually cast that spell of mine. And I will also get some willpower. So that's gonna be great as well. So we're gonna put this, actually we're gonna leave this right here. So now I'm gonna show you something very important about this game. So once you build your mage tower and you end the turn there, you are able to start promoting apprentices, including now at the end is a free action because I just put my mage tower down. So see how there are these higher levels of magic? The way that apprentices get to those is by dueling. So let's say that these guys would like to fight it out to see who can become an advanced apprentice between will and time. They're gonna fight it out and then one apprentice will make it. The other one goes back to my company, not the bag, to my company, so I can just put him somewhere. He's ashamed of himself right now, but I'll just use him to hold some territory in the future. And you can do this as many times as you like while you're, you happen to be there in these rounds. So this guy's gonna go back to my company. This one has made it to a higher level of magic. You can also, of course, continue to have your apprentices battle it out to battle them out all the way up the chain. So like, let's say that I wanna get a master level spell right now. I actually can do that by having these guys fight and then promoting one more, which you know what, I may actually do. So we're actually just gonna go ahead and get a master level apprentice here because it comes with a pretty sweet spell bonus in the solo game. So now you can see that's how apprentices promote, which is why I was putting so many of them every time I had a chance into that lower level when I would go to the race enclaves, because you just have to do that. If you don't, you end up really, really stuck because, um, you know, you need more apprentices so that they can battle it out and keep moving up the chain. You just need those bodies. And actually, because there are no master level spells in the game, that means that instead of having access to the master level spell, this apprentice can access all three of the spells in these areas, which is actually pretty great for him. What that also means is that there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to, um, to stop here in terms of doing some dueling. So I'm actually going to, 
What do you think about this? Yeah, I think this is the best. So I'm gonna duel these guys out. And I am going to go ahead and leave someone here and put him back in the company because this spell is already covered. This one I'll lose, but that's really okay. I haven't been using the reroll too much anyway. So now I've got these guys who are kind of climbing ladder. And if I can get some more princesses in this area, these areas and do a little dueling, then I can get a master level apprentice on this area as well. And don't forget, I need to have four before the game is over. And what that means is that I'm gonna really need to spend time doing that and then hopefully spend the rest of my rounds doing a bunch of territory control to take the Warlord out. So before we go, we're gonna do one more Warlord turn, even though that's only half of a turn, just so I can show you guys theoretically how a spell might work. So let's say that I wanna cast Stone Skin, and this is gonna last me until the beginning of my next round. What I'm gonna do, since it's a basic level spell, is I'm going to spend one will to cast it. So this spell is now active. If I had like a normal display, I'd put it above my mantle. I'm just trying to keep everything on screen for you guys. So now, if he takes out any of my guys, I get blood relics and they go back to my company, not to my supply, which is very convenient for me right now. So let's see if the warlord takes any of my people out. All right, so he rolled a six. He was on that inner ring, and so now he's gonna come straight this way. Let's see which direction he will go. Ah, four. So he's just gonna go clockwise, but he's going to go one, two, three, four, and take my guy out, five, and he'll drop one of his guys here. But one thing that's been really good about this is that I don't have to put him back in my supply bag. I can put him immediately back into my little entourage of wizards. And remember how that was looking pretty depleted? Now, after all of those promotions and also getting that dude back from the Warlord, I actually have a few more to work with, so it'll be easier for me to initiate some more apprentices and or take over space on the map. So all the spells are pretty useful for that sort of thing. Anyway, I hope that you have enjoyed my little showcase of Archmage. This is a really fun little game with a cool solo variant Thematically, I mean, it has a very Euro feel as it plays, but it's also quite thematic. Everything that you do in the game makes sense in terms of the game world that Tim Hiram has created. And I've had a really good time exploring the different spells, trying to come up with good spell combos. And I also really do enjoy playing this with other people as well. My students are a huge fan of this game at Game Club. I am a huge fan of it at home. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily buy it for solo mode only, but it's got a really solid solo mode. I love seeing solo modes in Euro field games that have an actual opponent to compete with who messes with you. And this is a really good, simple, low upkeep way of doing it. It's something that I wish that I saw in more games with solo modes. So this is Archmage, definitely check it out and happy gaming. <laughs>